My name is Alan Birga. Um, on behalf of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, uh, which is the nonprofit arm of the National Press Club, uh, we are thrilled to have with our book and author series having, taking place tonight uh, two very special guests, uh, John Mackey and Raj Sisodia, who have, who have collaborated on the book Conscious Capitalism, uh, Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business, um, which I see from the Amazon sales figures is selling quite well. And I know you've been on the road for the last four weeks promoting your book. So thanks for taking the time to come here to the National Press Club this evening. Um, I'm Alan Birga, a former president of the National Press Club from 2010. I cover agriculture for Bloomberg News. So I'm especially excited to ask some questions as a, as a fellow foodie about some of the things that took place in your book, which I found very interesting reading this weekend. Uh, John Mackey, the co-CEO and co-founder of Whole Foods Market, has devoted his life to selling natural and organic foods, uh, starting with a store called Safer Way in the 1970s, and rising with as well as shaping the growth of the organic food sector. Organic foods were barely in public consciousness when Mackey started. It now takes up about one-eighth of the fresh produce segment of grocery sales and consistently is outstripping the growth of conventional foods in overall retail sales. Mackey's devotion to sustainable, healthy products has led to some unconventional approaches, labeling fish sold in his stores as unsustainable, for example. But the numbers don't lie. Whole Foods has seen consistent growth throughout its history, and if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, witness the organic food sections of his competitors' stores. Mackey is also a co-founder of the nonprofit Conscious Capitalism Incorporated, which encourages better business models that unlock the creative potential of employees and emphasizes long-term growth over the short-termism that he says infects businesses today. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that this evening. Also joining us is Dr. Raj Sisodia, co-founder and trustee of Conscious Capitalism and a professor of marketing at Bentley University, which is near Boston. He has written seven books, including Firms of Endearment, a profile of companies that excel in conscious capitalist principles. More about these can be found at the website, ConsciousCapitalism.org, where you can learn more about the concept. Thank you for joining us at the National Press Club this evening, John and Raj. Uh, John, you have a few words to say? Uh, well, yeah, let's see. I can move a little ways here, but not too far. Yeah, thanks, Raj. I thought it'd be a good idea just to do a little bit, since I assume most people haven't read the book that are here, just to sort of tee up kind of the basic principles of the book. So I'll try to do it very quickly. But um, in essence, we believe that uh, business and capitalism have been the greatest value creators in the history of the world. That in our research, we show that in the last 200 years ago, as capitalism was really invented about 200 years ago, 85% of the people alive 200 years ago lived on less than $1 a day. That figure's gone down to 16%. It's still too high, but the trajectory is we'll probably wipe out abject poverty in the 21st century across the planet. The rates 200 years ago across the planet were over 90%. They're down to about 14% today. The average lifespan 200 years ago was only about 30. Today it's 68, 78 in the United States, 80 in Japan, or over 80 in Japan. And business, though, has primarily been seen and perceived by the critics of business. Business is routinely attacked as selfish and greedy and exploitative. Corporations are portrayed as sociopaths that uh, care only about money and that they're, they need to be caged up for the good of the public. And what we believe is that there are certainly bad actors in, in business. We're not going to defend uh, the Enrons and the WorldComs and the Bernie Madoffs, but most business is based on voluntary exchange, and it benefits all of the stakeholders who trade with it, the customers, the employees, the suppliers, the investors, the communities that business is part of. While we like to believe that business is fundamentally good because it creates value, it could be so much better. And we've written our book in a way to try to inspire business people to engage in business in a more conscious way. And we define basically four tenets of conscious capitalism. The first tenet is every business has the potential to have a higher purpose besides only making money. And not that there's anything wrong with making money. Doctors make money, but their purpose is not to make money. Their purpose is to heal people, 
teachers educate, architects design buildings, engineers construct things. Even journalists, at least some of them, try to uncover the truth instead of <laughs> sensationalizing things. The Hopefully the ones in this room. Um, so business has this potential for higher purpose, and that's the first tenet. And uh, secondly, that business should be engaged in to create value for all of its major interdependent stakeholders, not just the investors. That we think of the stakeholders as sort of integrated into a system so that you have customers, employees, suppliers, investors, communities that we're all part of. And the conscious business is deliberately and consciously creating value for all of them. I sometimes explain that, like as a retailer at Whole Foods, that our job is to hire the very best people we can find, make sure they're well trained, and then make sure they are happy in the workplace, that they flourish. And then happy team members serve the customers better, and that results in happy customers. Happy customers market the business, they're loyal, the business flourishes, that leads to happy investors. Happy team members result in happy customers, result in happy investors. The conscious business understands these interrelationships and then begins to create value consciously and deliberately for all of them. So you can optimize the entire system. The third tenet of conscious capitalism is we need a different kind of leadership, what we call conscious leadership. Leadership that has a higher degree of emotional and spiritual intelligence. Leadership that is not primarily in it for power or wealth, but to serve the enterprise and its higher purpose. So they're a type of servant leaders. And fourth, we have to create cultures deliberately and consciously that help human beings to flourish, reach their highest potential, and self-actualize themselves. There are certain principles and organizations that lead to human flourishing and some that don't. Conscious businesses are deliberate about the creation of their cultures. And so those four principles are the way we organize the book. So higher purpose, stakeholder integration, conscious leadership, and empowered cultures. And uh, with that, I think we can get into the questions. All right. Just a little bit about how we're going to go forward this evening. Um, there are question cards that have been provided to you um, on which you can write your questions and pass them forward. We have question cards, right? No. They're outside. That's a great place for them. <laughs> I think we're going to do a little bit of improv here. Well, we're not going to jump into those right away anyway. Hey, well, that's the point. When these question cards are passed along and distributed, you're going to write on them. And you're going to pass them up just like this man did. They'll probably start to agglomerate as you pass them forward, and they'll be brought up in a group so that you're not constantly making their way through. Um, I'll be looking through these. It's, if you've ever been to a National Press Club luncheon, it's the same sort of format. Um, in the meantime, while we're populating that and, and getting these questions written in, I also accept small little pieces of paper, things written on business cards and napkins as well, as long as it's legible. Um, in the meantime, I have a few questions also prepared uh, going through this. And, and again, this was a very interesting uh, read on this book. And uh, it's interesting to see a take on, on capitalism, which you said has, has been maligned in a lot of criticisms for being inhumane, for lack of a better word. And you talking a bit about the humanity and, and what capitalism can provide to a society. In your book, you describe as one of your purposes educating people about healthy food choices, um, talking about reducing poverty worldwide. And in fact, you state in your book, one of Whole Foods' higher purposes is to help end poverty. Closer to DC, Whole Foods has been a big supporter of the Capital Area Food Bank, um, been active in the community. But one thing you often don't see is Whole Foods locations in a lower income urban area, the sort of place where maybe a fresh grocer or a Save-A-Lot may be. Who is Whole Foods educating? Um, given your prevalence to be in more affluent areas, are you already educating people who already know more than the general population? Um, and related to that, how do you combat what may be a consumer perception of an elitism? I actually was talking about my interview with you this morning, and a person talk, referred to you as the CEO of Whole Paycheck. So, so how do you deal with I've that? Never heard that one before. <laughs> You've only been on the road that's for four so weeks. That's so original. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think several things. Uh, interesting thing, of course, is Whole Foods has opened stores in less affluent areas. When we opened our location, for example, in P Street, uh, 
that was hardly an affluent area when we opened it up. But over time, that community is, has evolved. Uh, and it's now a more affluent area as people have moved in because Whole Foods is there. When we opened our store in Chicago, our first store in Chicago was in an area that was only a couple blocks from Capri Greens, which was a, a notorious housing, uh, a low income housing area with projects. And we watched that area transform itself as well. So, in addition, our company is going to be. Um, opening uh, a non, we have two nonprofits, Whole Planet Foundation, which does microcredit loans uh, uh, in the developing world and in cities in the United States as well, as well as the Whole Kids Foundation, which does uh, salad bars in schools and garden grants. Um, and we're going to start a new foundation in 2013 that we're calling Whole Cities. It's going to open really nonprofit stores in these food desert areas that, of places that don't have uh, great access to food uh, for healthy food. And the f first three cities that we're looking at, DC is not actually one of the cities we're looking at right now, but uh, Newark and Chicago and New Orleans will probably be where we test out that concept. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we are what we are, and uh, uh, I don't see that it's a failing of our business to be authentic and try to create value for the customers we create. If Others believe that there's market opportunities that are being missed. I encourage them to exercise their own entrepreneurial creativity and go solve those problems. Uh, it's not beholden on Whole Foods to solve all the world's problems. We're doing a lot of good as it is, and we will do more good, but uh, uh, there's not everything we can take on. Well, and one thing you mentioned in your book is that a business also has a responsibility to be profitable because a profitable business is a business that can grow and improve in its mission. So could you elaborate a little more on what may be seen as that tension between being profitable and doing good in the community? I don't think there is a tension. And Raj and I talk a lot about in the book about uh, trade-offs. We talk about how the analytical intelligence uh, looks for trade-offs, some of the most Intelligent people I met in terms of IQ uh, have, uh, may not have as, always as developed a emotional intelligence or a systems intelligence. And if you look for trade-offs, you'll find trade-offs. If you look for synergies, if you look for the win-win strategies, you'll find those strategies. So when we talk about trade-offs, oftentimes it's just a simple lack of creativity and imagination. You haven't, and I always like to say, if you're still if you find trade-offs and you can't find the win-win, then you just got to keep looking you, because you can create it. So um, uh, I got to try that back to your question. So repeat that question. question. You were talking about the about the tension between profitability oh. and serving a community. Right. So you want to create the win-win strategies that serve all the stakeholders, so that the customers benefit, the team members benefit. The suppliers benefit, the investors benefit, and the communities benefit. That's the win-win-win strategies. And, I, and I, I think Whole Foods has largely found those solutions. We're not perfect. We don't hold ourselves up as perfect. We've, we've still got lots of room to grow and evolve. But um, we have found that it's possible to create value for communities and be profitable. Uh, that's what we've been proving it for 30 plus years now. And when you're talking about stakeholders, uh, you speak both of sort of the traditional stakeholders, of the suppliers, the employees, but you also broaden the stakeholders to talk about government or media, for example. Right. Um, a key thesis of your book is that business is good. Um, the mission of business is noble. And businesses are built by people. Um, journalists are people, I think. And some of them are good. Uh, government is made up of people, but you seem much more skeptical um, in how some of those sectors function in our society. Um, is it simply a case of good people going into business and bad people going into government, or are there some problems of purpose here? Well, I'm going to let Raj partly ta uh, tackle this question, but let me make an interesting uh, point. We talk about business needing to find its higher purpose. We know that the Gallup now shows that the overall approval rating of big business in America is only 19 percent. That means 81 percent of Americans don't approve of big business. That is a two-point higher approval rate than Congress has. 
And, but if you think about it, big business isn't trusted in America, Congress isn't trusted, but I challenge you to name any institution in America that still has a high degree of trust. Do we trust our healthcare system? Do we trust our educational system? Do we trust our journalists? Uh, I, I, I think that uh, we trust our, our, our politicians. Uh, the lack of trust institutionally is, is, is at all, like an almost an all-time low in American history. And that's because not only does business need to discover its higher purpose, but all of these areas have got to discover or rediscover their higher purpose. We've all gotten into just short-term, self-interested thinking. And as a result, our, our country is beginning to decline. Actually, it's declining at a fairly rapid rate. Raj? Uh, well, if you do look at Gallup's data on confidence in societal institutions, ironically, the, the highest is at 85% the US military still has an extremely high level of confidence. And the second highest is small business at about 65% the last time I looked. So it is interesting that people do have faith and confidence and trust in small business. And yet every big business was once a small business. So what happens when a small business becomes larger and becomes publicly traded is there seems to be this divergence or this loss of trust and this perceived divergence from their agenda and the, and the agenda of society as a whole. And I think that's one of the things that we have to address. The larger the co corporation, the bigger its impact on the world, the larger its wake, if you will. And therefore, the greater the necessity for what it's doing to be aligned with what society really needs overall. I and mean, if you think about Walmart today, it's approaching $500 billion in revenue. That was the global GDP in the year 1800. Right? So, well, if you can compare that or not, but it's a, it's a very, very large presence that corporations today have. And therefore, for them to operate with a higher level of consciousness uh, becomes a very powerful thing. Because the same entity, if it's operating at a low level of consciousness, which is thinking short-term, thinking self-interest, thinking trade-offs, um, thinking of stakeholders as means to an end, rather than treating all of them as ends in themselves. When you have all of that, you actually short-circuit the, the engine of value creation. And when you actually align all the things that John talked about together, what we find is that these conscious businesses are creating multiple kinds of wealth and value. So uh, it is financial, but also intellectual and social and cultural and emotional and spiritual and ecological and physical well-being for all of their stakeholders, including their communities, including their customers and suppliers. A traditional business is content to try to make financial uh, wealth for its shareholders. And it doesn't always succeed at that. And increasingly, these things are tied in together. If you're not producing all of those kinds of well-being, all of your stakeholders will not be engaged, will not be passionate. You know, we have a shocking statistic in this country that only 25% of people are engaged in their work. 75% of people are either indifferent or hostile to their, to their work and to their employer. And so how much passion and creativity and inspiration and caring are we going to get when people find such little meaning and purpose in their work lives? Well, let's talk about meaning and purpose in work lives because there's an example that's given in the book. Um, you're talking about, um, it was a shame of management, I think the phrase that was used, uh, in which com companies don't create purposeful workplaces. People aren't given an opportunity to find meaning, purpose, and happiness by contributing to a company. A few pages after that passage, you talk about waste management, a company that has created purpose, a new purpose, by shifting from its traditional task of filling landfills to going green and actually reducing waste. But thinking about that example, there are still going to be landfills, and someone is still going to have to fill those landfills. If the fact is in the workplace, a lot of unpleasant things need to be done, and those unpleasant tasks, perhaps dull tasks, need workers. If waste management hadn't gone green, they'd be filling landfills, and if they aren't, someone is. So are there simply cases in which businesses and companies are going to have work where you're just not going to find a lot of meaning and purpose? Go ahead. Well, uh Every particular business, part of, I mean, I'm in the, we're in the grocery business of Whole Foods. This is about as mundane uh, a business as there is. And, and yet, we have a higher purpose. We're, we have a number of higher purposes. We're trying to help heal America. 69% of America is overweight, 36% is obese, 80% of the dollars we spend on health care are for basically lifestyle related, dietary lifestyle related diseases, um, heart disease stroke, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases, very high correlation. So by 
understanding that we're trying to help educate people about healthy eating and selling foods that help nourish people's health and well-being, that creates a sense of well-being for people throughout our stores, uh, that they're contributing their work to helping Heal America, uh, even though they might just be bagging groceries or checking people out, they're still part of a culture, part of a team that has that higher purpose. So the work itself may involve, I mean, if you go out and clean a park up, you're making your park and your city a, a neater place, but you're still picking up garbage. But now that, that task is infused with a sense of, of, of the contribution that you're making to making our world a better place. That's what makes the work uh, more meaningful, not that it maybe is intellectually stimulating, but that it's contributing to helping our world to make progress. And, and any business can reconceptualize. Or all, you know, there's going to be the tough cases, but virtually every business can reconceptualize itself in a sense that it's creating value for other people, and it can begin to communicate that. Questions are coming in from the audience, and themes are emerging. Um, Paraphrasing a couple questions, uh, do you believe that there is a limit to the upward spiral of capitalism? And do you think that no growth can be an effective business model? I don't think there's a limit. Growth changes uh, the type of things that, uh, you know, that it depends on how we define those terms. And uh, as we like to say, the, the resources on our planet are limited but human creativity is unlimited. And the type of things that people might value, for example, uh, just think about software. It doesn't take resources or it takes very little resources, but it creates great value for people. The, the way we're interconnected now on the internet is not necessarily huge resource draw, but it's enriching our lives. Information's flowing everywhere. The world is, is connecting up and that's growing but it's not necessarily using up resources. So we've got to get away from thinking of growth as just gobbling up resources and those different ways that human consciousness can evolve. You know, I mean, people don't always understand how far humanity has evolved. I gave you some economic figures. Let me give you some other, and, and Raj can, can jump in here, some other evidence of how far humanity has evolved in, say, the last 150 years. Consider the fact that 150 years ago, 14 of the 29 states still had legalized slavery. Consider the fact that 100 years ago, women did not have the right to vote. 75 years ago, most of the planet was still organized into colonial empires. 50 years ago, we still had Jim Crow laws and segregation, legal segregation in the United States. 50 years ago, there was no environmental consciousness. 25 years ago, half the planet was still largely organized under communism. Uh, Human consciousness is rapidly evolving, and it's essential that our business enterprises evolve their consciousness as well. People want and expect more from business, and the conscious businesses are going to be the ones that are going to flourish and succeed in the marketplace because humans want that. And this is a demand that people are making. They want to have relevant work. They want to have meaningful work. They want business to contribute to their well-being. So I don't think there's any limits for growth, but growth will take different forms because human needs and desires will become, uh, at a, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they'll move up to more self-actualization. They'll be emotional and intellectual needs more so than resource needs. Uh, we won't just get more and more automobiles, for example. We'll end up with different types of, uh, uh, of uh, satisfaction that humans will seek. Several questions, this being Washington, dealing with politics and more specifically health care. An F word hangs over the room and it has seven letters. Um, but tying into this, uh, at the Cato Institute yesterday, you said you would shrink the federal government to 10% of its current size and you applauded the privatization of Social Security. You've also made remarks about Obamacare and your feelings on the health care reforms in recent weeks. Um, dealing with those issues, given the current political environment, how realistically can health care reform uh, possibly be changed? And how would one go about shrinking the government to the size that you would want it to be? I think you said two ten percent. As I recall, you said by 10 percent. It's a big difference. No, I'd like I'll to see. Word on I would one. like I to see a much anything. smaller government. I mean, in the United States today, um, the government is spending 40 percent of the GDP. A huge chunk of the federal government, 40 cents out of every dollar, they're borrowing from other countries. 
or we're just printing money and taking the Fed's doing it. It's not a sustainable path. We talk about long-term sustainability. Americans are going to have to have a discussion on how large we want our government to be. And from my perspective, in my opinion, this is a democracy. I'd like to see smaller government. There's no question about it. Now, I'm at the Cato Club. It's a libertarian group. Uh, so is it realistic that we can shrink the government to 10% of what it is today, tomorrow? Well, obviously not. But you have to understand, in most of American history, government, I mean, as little as 100 years ago, the government only spent about 4 to 5% of the GDP. Now it's been 40%. So we've had this massive governmental growth. And I would like to see a country that has more liberty and less government. Um, and, but obviously that's going to be, it's going to take a long time to do that. It's not uh, going to happen overnight. And uh, it'll probably never be as small as it once was uh, when America was at its kind of peak and its economic growth. But yeah, I mean, I make no secret about it. I, I believe in free enterprise capitalism. I'm a, I'm a proud capitalist. And I've written a book to help business to evolve to a higher level of consciousness. I think business is good, and I think we can make it great. That's what I believe. People are free to disagree with it, but that's my perspective. What are your thoughts on some of the immigration proposals you've seen coming through? Obviously, there are immigrants who would be among the stakeholders. Yeah, I really would really like to talk more about the book. And just oh, general, there are lots of questions about the book. General books. politics in America. I'm, I'm a grocer at the end of the day. I have no great wisdom to bestow on our political uh, discussions that are happening around the world. I just you know, have my own opinions. I realize that uh, that's more interesting in Washington, D.C. to talk about uh, <coughs> conscious capitalism, but we are here to talk about conscious capitalism, so I wish we could stick to those general sure. topics. Sure. Excuse me, there is um, a question that ties uh, politics with food, um, about which I have several questions from the audience on this, and that's the topic of labeling GMOs. Um, last fall, there was a very expensive campaign in California over Proposition 37. Uh, you were supporting Proposition 37. There were some organic activists, such as the Cornucopia Institute, um, that said that your desire to even out the spending of, say, Monsanto helped lead to the measure's defeat. Was there anything about Prop 37 that made you ambivalent? What will the future be of GMO products in the U.S.? Well, that's like four questions, but... Um... Question one. Was there anything about Prop 37 that made you ambivalent? No, Whole Foods Market supports transparency in our food supply, which is why we supported Prop 37. We think people have a right to know what's in their food. We know that consumers are very concerned about GMOs. And because they're concerned about it, we would like there to be transparency about that. We've supported that consistently ever, for, ever since this became an issue. And we will continue to support it. And I believe we will eventually have labeling of GMOs. In fact, Whole Foods Market will work towards transparency in our own food supply with this. This is an initiative that we're already done it with our private label program and we look to move it through our whole food supply. We'll be the only grocer doing that in the United States. And then the second question, some of what you've already addressed, uh, what do you see as the future of GMO foods in the U.S.? Uh, I, I mean, as long as they continue to pass, uh, uh, as long as GMOs are legal, then we're going to see more and more foods that are produced with uh, genetically modified uh, ingredients. And so I'd say, unless that changes politically, that we'll see more of it. Getting back to the book. That would be nice. One, tra one trap that you say CEOs fall into is a trap of narcissism. With your company, you've created a world, and you're at the center of it. Tell us about a time. I, I'll reject that first premise. I am not at the center of the Whole Foods Market world. That is incorrect. That is not true. So elaborate. What's to elaborate? Well, I, it's, I, it's the Whole Foods Market has seventy-seven thousand people working there. We're decentralized into teams. The teams are self-managing. We have a, a culture of empowerment, and uh, I, you know, I am not at the center of Whole Foods Market. I am the, you know, co-founder of the company. So I have a. a Obviously, I have a role. I'm the co-CEO. Um, I'm not even the sole CEO. I'm not the chairman of the board. I'm not at the center of Whole Foods Market. So I'll reject that. What, where are you heading? Well, second part of the question. It, are we getting back to the book here, Alan? Or are we, uh, Tell about? us about a time someone at Whole Foods told you something you didn't want to hear and you changed as a result. Um, somebody at Whole Foods Market? Does it have to be a team member or... Um, let's see. 
Uh, Someone in the universe. Could it be an activist, the, like the activist with the food, uh, animal welfare? That's well, I, I mean, one of my favorite <clears throat> examples, which we talk in the book, was back in 2003. So 10 years ago, Whole Foods Market was having its annual meeting in Santa Monica, California, and we had animal welfare protesters out there. They were protesting Whole Foods Market for selling us a specific kind of duck meat that they considered to be come from factory farms and they wanted us to stop selling that duck meat. So they kind of hijacked our, our annual meeting uh, and uh, uh, we ended up having a, a, a dialogue with the activists and I particularly began a dialogue with one of the activists, a woman named Lauren Ornelius and we began swapping emails. It was very interesting because uh, after a few months of emails, she basically said, you know, Mr. Mackey, I appreciate that you are a very idealistic man, but when it comes to animal welfare, when it comes to livestock practices in America, you're not that well informed about the subject. And since you're running a pretty large company, you owe it to yourself and to your stakeholders to become better informed. I was a little bit taken back about that because I thought I, I knew more than most CEOs of food retailers about the issues. but. Uh, that summer, I read about a dozen books on livestock practices and animal welfare, and by the end of the summer, I concluded, you know what, she's right. I really didn't know that much. And I changed my diet. I became a vegan. I've been a vegan for the last 10 years. And uh, I be began to realize we have to change, that Whole Foods Market has a responsibility to try to improve animal welfare practices in the United States. And we began a dialogue with those activists. We took them inside and asked them to work with us to set standards that we could do to help raise animal welfare levels. And now that's, you see it in our stores now with our animal welfare rating program where we have five, uh, uh, one through five plus ratings on many of our uh, animal food products and we'll eventually have that on all of our animal food products. So that's an example of someone telling me something and uh, uh, changing my mind about it and learning and growing and, and uh, I think Whole Foods is benefit and I think the animals are benefiting. A member of the audience asks, um, can you elaborate on the concept of employee happiness that you explain in the book and how you measure it? Let's follow up on that is, is pay a key component of creating happiness? Well, I'm not sure how we measure it at Whole Foods, but uh, employee engagement is certainly one, one dimension. Employee. Uh, retention, if you look at the turnover rate, I mean part of the book of course is, is not just about Whole Foods, it's about a whole set of companies out there globally that are doing this and my research has, has looked at that for the last seven, eight years. Um, so these companies are very different from the norm where you have extremely high turnover in the retail sector for example, triple digit turnover is not uncommon. The average tenure might be about nine months, whereas many of these companies have single digit turnover in their uh, in their full-time workforce. The container store, for example, is in the low single digits. So that indicates that the very high retention rate, very high satisfaction rate, they are much better uh, compensated, but also they have opportunities to grow and evolve. So everybody sort of comes in at that level, but there are many paths for them to evolve and um, get into leadership positions because of the way in the, which these, country, these companies are decentralized and everybody's empowered uh, to act. So, you know, you get one of the phrases I like to use as human beings, we call them a resource, and we have HR departments in every company, but a resource is like a lump of coal. You use it, it burns up, it's gone. Human beings are really a source. A source is like the sun. It continuously generates light and warmth and energy and creativity and inspiration and caring when it comes to human beings. That's what we human beings are capable of. And in these companies, the vast majority of people are really truly operating as a source. They're not just automatons carrying out a predetermined uh, task. And therefore, you get extraordinary levels of, of, of caring and also innovation and inspiration and creativity. And ultimately, that is the biggest differentiator across companies. Every company, you know, you can differentiate based upon the amount of creative human energy and caring energy that you're able to elicit. And most businesses do a dismal job of that. They simply are not worthy of people giving their whole selves. But conscious businesses are. And that's really what ultimately makes the difference. And keeping the spotlight on you for a moment, Raj, we have a question from the audience for, addressed specifically toward you. Um, could you talk a I little- I have relatives in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming to the National Press Club this evening, Raj's relatives. Um, 
we would all like, not just your relatives, to know this. Um, a little bit about some of the evolution of your thought on conscious capitalism, and maybe something even in the last couple years that has changed your understanding of conscious capitalism in practice. You know, it's been an interesting journey. I've been a business uh, student and business professor now for 28, 28 years as a professor and well over 30 years as a student of business. And it was only when I stumbled into this area that I, that I started to see that there's a different narrative about business. You know, the whole narrative about business and capitalism was hijacked by outsiders, hijacked by economists who were looking to explain this thing that they really had no experience of. And they were looking to explain it mathematically. They reduced business to a math problem, maximize this subject to this. And they basically, to make their models work, said it's all about maximizing profits. And then you had the Marxists who took that idea and said, okay, this is basically based on exploitation. It is zero sum. It's about accumulating wealth. And we've taken that and essentially enshrined it into into business school curricula, and that's how people are taught, and that's how, therefore, they behave and they to become managers and leaders. They think that is their role. Uh, but in fact, what I found in, 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 uh, in starting to do this research, and I'm a marketing professor, and it was really motivated by trying to find companies that did not spend and waste a ton of money on marketing, and yet had customers who were loyal and trusting to them, and in fact, loved them. Because the reality in America is the opposite. We're spending a trillion dollars a year on marketing, and what we found is that the more the company spends on marketing, the less they have customer loyalty and trust. So we simply set out, it was called In Search of Marketing Excellence. We set out to find companies that didn't spend a lot and yet had great customer loyalty and trust. And we found Whole Foods and we found a few other companies. And we quickly discovered it really wasn't about marketing, that their employees were equally loyal and trusting, that their communities really welcomed and embraced these companies. They had stable long-term supplier partnerships. They had uh, leaders who were different. They had a different sense of why they existed, these companies, so the sense of purpose. So we sort of uncovered a much larger story. We went looking for this little answer, and we discovered this hole. It's like digging a hole, and you discover this big cave in there. Um, and it was a truly a revelation to me, because as I said, in 30 years, I had never heard anybody talk about business in those terms, and I didn't know it was even possible. And then through a series of fortunate events, I managed to, uh, we, John and I met, and then, then we discovered a shared passion to not only for him to run his business that way, but actually to catalyze a movement of other similar, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of unconscious, conscious capitalists in the world, some of whom have been doing it for 100 years or more. And now we're giving them some language around it. We're giving a little framework around it, and it's, it's getting enriched and, uh, and growing over time. But, you know, we're finding that this is touching a deep hunger that is inside people. Nobody wants to leave their human half at home when they go to work. People want to be able to express love and care in the context of their work. They want to be able to have a sense of passion about what they're doing. Um, and now we're telling them not only is that okay, but this, these companies, my research found that these companies actually outperform the market nine to one over a 10 year period. And now we've added five more years of data. So over a 15 year period, these companies have outperformed 10 and a half times the overall market. And they haven't done it by squeezing anybody. In fact, they've created many other kinds of wealth simultaneously. Uh, while they're creating financial wealth. And, and you look at that story, you say, wow, how can you not share that? So I, I've come alive, and this has become my personal calling now mm -hmm. to be doing this kind of work for the rest of my career, I'm sure. And Just to note, um, we have about 15 minutes left, and have loved getting all the questions, and we're going to get to as many as I can. Just want to note, um, even though some of my questions can be long and rambling, um, please try to keep your own questions short and succinct. Um, do not follow my example in this instance. Um, it will increase your chances of getting your question asked, because I'm seeing a lot of great questions, but some of them are running lengthy. And short and sweet and to the point is good. And here's one that is short, sweet, and to the point, uh, directed to both of you. What advice would you give to small businesses on how to attract good investors that are aligned in heart and mind? What's more important, a passion or a plan? You know, I think there are increasingly now conscious investors out there. Right? So when you look at any stakeholder, you know, you've got needs at multiple levels. So yes, at some level, investors want a return. But investors also want to have an impact. They're also the right kind of investor. Many investors want to put their money where it's actually going to make a tangible difference. So I think, as they say, you get the investors you deserve. And if you look for the right kind of investors, you don't look for the, you know, the hot money, as we call it, right? The somebody who's coming in with an exit strategy who wants to simply flip this thing and, uh, you know, turn it around. So we have, for example, a private equity firm, Leonard Green, that's part of our uh, 
community now, which has invested in Whole Foods, invested in the, the container store, and they have had such extraordinary uh, uh, results from those investments. I mean, Leonard Green has made probably over a billion dollars just on their Whole Foods investment. Over two billion. Two billion. Oh. And who's counting? <laughs> And, and so that, that private equity f firm, we sort of stumbled into these two opportunities. I mean, they were somewhat inclined, but they've made this their whole framework now. This is how they look now. The, all the companies they invest in, you know, we've got David Gardner here from The Motley Fool. The Motley Fool is all about looking now for these kinds of uh, companies in order to invest. And as he told us, and when we interviewed him, uh, short-term investing is an oxymoron. You know, when you, when you put money in for the short-term, you're just speculating. You're not investing. Investing is by definition long term. And those are the kinds of investors I think that, uh, that, that we should be looking for. Yeah, I kind of want to underscore that something Raj uh, said that um, these ideas are going to spread. This is not simple um, wishful thinking. And they're going to spread because they, it works better. And whatever works better in business gets duplicated and improved upon. Conscious businesses do outperform in the marketplace. And so if you have our book, you might, if you don't believe that, read Appendix A as a, as a first indicator of that. And so I think it's important in terms of that question to go ahead and to go ahead and put your values out there and be authentic because you want to attract investors who align with your own purpose and your own consciousness. You'll get, the, you'll get the investors that you deserve to get. So go ahead and be authentic and be yourself. Turning back to food, question from the audience. In your book, you talk a lot about being a real leader in local foods mm -hmm. and really expanding your supplier network to incorporate a lot of local producers, some of which then become nationally distributed. Um, on the other side, how can organic food producers in less developed countries potential exporters to the U.S. get some of their products on your shelves? Well, they already are. I mean, Whole Foods Marketing, we do business in over 79 countries, and we're importing lots of organic food from, from developing nations all around the world. So it's already happening. The biggest challenge in the developing world, of course, is uh, the infrastructure from a transportation standpoint. But fortunately, a lot of these are getting organized into co-ops, and, and through the co-ops, they're able to market together. So you get these small farmers that, that team up together. That's probably best developed in the coffee, in the coffee industry, but there, it's increasingly true in lots of these other commodities as well. How concerned are you as a grocer about the sustainability of foods such as tuna? Do you foresee a day when some common food products will simply disappear? Well, uh, Whole Foods is very concerned about seafood sustainability. Um, you know, our company is very environmentally focused, and we think there are serious environmental issues that oftentimes don't get enough attention, because other ones get all the attention. But seafood sustainability is a very important issue, and I'm very proud of the fact that Whole Foods Market um, uh, set forth, we began to work with Monterey Bay Aquarium and, and Blue Ocean Institute to begin labeling our seafood, and those that were not uh, uh, sustainable, we, we marked and, as red and we phased them out. We've eliminated all the red species in our stores. And it's very important that we begin to, uh, that this consciousness spread and that people begin to, well, either stop eating seafood or begin to shop in a more conscious way to only purchase seafood that's sustainable. Uh, tuna, some species in tuna are endangered, uh, like a, say bluefin tuna, for example, has been under a lot of pressure. And other tunas are still quite abundant. But uh, I'll give you a great story that, in our, that we point out in the book, which was cod was the most abundant fish in the Western Hemisphere when Columbus sailed over here. And it built the New England fish and, and fishing industry as well as the uh, Canadian uh, Atlantic fish and fishing industry. And, Cod stocks are down 95% to what they were a couple hundred years ago. And in fact, it was a red endangered species that Whole Foods Market had to get rid of. And uh, that, the end of the story was Marine Shorts Dip Council, which is a seafood sustainability fishery certifier, we were able to find one cod producer that is fishing in a sustainable way. So we have a, a very limited amount of cod still available, which is pretty well exclusively sold in Boston since that's kind of the, 
If, some states have a, a state bird, I think they have a state fish, and it's the cod. But it's a very serious issue, and I urge you to inform yourself better about it. If it's so good and good to be purposeful, why aren't more others practicing these tenets? Why is it hard? What's in the way? Again, we, we think the, the, that narrative's been hijacked. It's been hijacked. We've been teaching. I mean, I've been part of the problem in the sense of business schools have been teaching uh, the wrong theories. You know, there's a wonderful article that uh, one of my colleagues wrote some years ago called Why Bad, Bad Theories Are Destroying Good Management, Bad Management Theories. And so we're teaching a certain way of thinking about the world in business schools. And then people take that and they practice that. So we've been perpetuating this model. And so a big part of our purpose as a movement is also not only to try to impact existing businesses and then entrepreneurs and inspire them to, to create these purposeful enterprises, but also to change the way we educate the next generation of leaders. Because business schools now are so many around the world. I mean, it's such a large percentage of students that go into business. And beyond that, even earlier, even in high schools, even earlier than that, I think we need to create the right story here. You know, we've just created this toxic story around business. And anybody who, who decides not to become a lawyer or a doctor and, and decides to go into business school, you know, in a way feels ashamed. Like, I'm not idealistic. I'm not doing something worth doing. I'm just like, you know, I'm going to become an accountant and make money. You know, that's kind of the mindset. And I did a, a survey on that recently, and we, we sort of confirmed that. Whereas business, in fact, can be the choice for idealistic people, because this is the way that we can affect change more sustainably on a larger scale in the world. You know, if you look at, you know, we, we have a credo where we say business is good because it's based on value creation, it's ethical because it's based on voluntary exchange, that business is noble because it elevates our existence and it's heroic because it lifts people out of poverty. Now those things, you cannot say that governments have done that, you cannot say that religious institutions have done that or nonprofits have done that. All of them have their role, but they cannot lift billions of people out of poverty. They just can't because that money has to come from somewhere else. Every cent of taxes ever spent by a government has to be generated in profit by a business. And so how can we not focus there as the first? And if we can do it there, we should do it there. If it cannot be done there, then we look to nonprofits or we look to religious institutions. Well, we've written the book to wake people up about the business can have a higher purpose. So, I mean, if people already knew that, we wouldn't have had to write the book. Uh, I, I, one of the interesting questions I get as I've gone on this book tour is if, how come more people aren't doing it? It's such a good idea. And it's like, well, because they, they're not conscious yet. The whole point of it is we've created a movement to try to get business people to understand that they have this potential for higher purpose besides just making money and to create a new consciousness about business. And uh, I think we're having some success. I will tell you that it's business people that are buying the book. They do these book signings. It's the business people that are buying it. It's not necessarily reaching a, uh, the anti-business crowd isn't buying the book. It's business people are buying it. And that's fine, because we wrote this for business people primarily. Would people who are in the anti-business crowd have a less evolved sense of consciousness by not being open to business? I'm asking that somewhat facetiously, but there's a point there, which Consciousness is, is on a continuum. It's not like uh, there are some people that are conscious and others who are mm. unconscious. But we all have the potential to have a higher degree of consciousness. And yes, I would say the anti-business people they cannot appreciate that business can make contributions and then it can be done at a more conscious level. To that degree, they aren't fully conscious either and they need to awaken their consciousness. So I would hope they would read the book, but uh, most of them uh, uh, don't, I think, don't want to read it because they've already made it. They've got ideological lock-in. There's one concept you talk about in the book um, that has had some adherence in recent years, which is the, the for-benefit corporation. The corporation that isn't necessarily set up as a pure profit-making entity, but it's not a nonprofit either, differences in how boards are organized and such. What role does the for-benefit model play in fostering a higher consciousness, if, it, if any? Do you want to tackle or do you want me to? You, you have a view on that. They're talking about B Corps, and uh, uh, I mean, we're in favor of B Corps. It's not like we're against B Corps. B Corps are, they're, they're and then I think about eight or nine states now have passed laws to permit the B Corps to, and it basically B Corps, uh, uh, and the essence of it is, is that they legally recognize that 
values such as uh, social responsibility and environmental um, good or, or should be a pair pursue with uh, uh, profit making. And I mean, as far as it goes, that's fine. We don't think that, we think the traditional uh, ownership model where we think the owners basically ought to control business, that, that, uh, that the manager shouldn't control it. And, the ma and basically B corporations are saying, well, management doesn't have to be accountable to the owners to the extent that they're still being responsible socially and also have environmental integrity. And we think you can, do, the, conscious, uh, the conscious capitalism model basically says, you can create value for all your stakeholders and have environmental integrity. You don't need special laws for it. What you need to be is creative and innovative. So we think the B Corps are consistent with conscious capitalism. We see them as fellow travelers. But insofar as a B Corporation, uh, uh, nonprofits have a competitive advantage because they get tax deductibility uh, for their donations. And regular corporations can have an advantage in raising capital because they don't necessarily have this constraint on ownership control. So I'm all for B Corps. We, they've come and spoke at our conferences before. I hope we see more of them. I think they're fellow travelers. We have time for a few more questions. So if you have one last burning topic you'd like to briefly write on a slip of paper, bring it on up. Several people have asked variations of the same question. And this is much more at the level of grocery store economics. How can a standard grocery store, like a Safeway, sell an organic vegetable at a less expensive price than Whole Foods? Well, I don't think they do. Based on our price surveys, we're, we come in about 7% cheaper than Safeway on average, or not 7 to 10% cheaper than Safeway. So I'll reject the thesis of that question. Why would people, you think, have that perception? Um, I think if you go into Whole Foods market, we have a complete continuum of prices. And if you want to shop for value, we have, for example, our 365 uh, private label line matches all the Trader Joe's prices across the board. And so, but if you come in, we have beautiful stores. They're, 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 they're beautiful, they're comfortable when people are in them. And some people come in with the expectation to see and find high prices. And if you look for high prices at Whole Foods, you won't spend a long time looking for them because they're there. We also tempt people, I've oftentimes hear this as well, I came in with a list, but those look so good, I couldn't help but put, put that in the bag. And, and so they get to the checkout and they spent more money than they had intended. Uh, but we've got $2.99 bottles of wine with our three wishes, and we've got bottles of wine going up to $1,000. So if that's what you're looking for, we can meet you at whatever level that you come in at. So I do think because we have beautiful stores and high level of service, that I think we create this expectation of being more expensive for a lot of people. Plus, it doesn't help that the journalists keep repeating over and over and over and over and over again that we're whole paycheck. So that's a perception. I didn't say that. That yes, was when I was talking yes, to you this did. morning. You said and she ain't the first it. one. I'm just reporting. Do not shoot the messenger. The journalists made up that saying, and they're the ones that keep repeating it in, in, in the media. So. Um, I will hold the journalist responsible for it. But uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, Whole Foods is obviously a very successful business. And, and many people find the price value ratio that Whole Foods does to be acceptable to them. And others don't. This is America. People have a freedom to choose to shop wherever they wish. We are not trying to be the least, least expensive grocery store. We're trying to be the highest quality grocery store. When you sell the highest quality of anything, whether it be automobiles, or clothing, or stereo equipment, the higher quality stuff's gonna be more expensive. And so, the higher quality stuff costs more, that's the way it is. The good news is, is the healthiest foods are the least expensive foods you can buy. That's the good news here. The least processed foods, the whole grains, the beans, the fresh fruits and vegetables and seasons, it's not that expensive to eat a really healthy diet. Our study shows, I know this, because I eat a really healthy diet, I cook and I don't spend very much money on food. Because you go buy a pound of brown rice, you're not gonna spend that much money. You go buy a pound of black beans, it's not that expensive. But you have to know how to cook, you have to shop in season, and um, you shouldn't need to spend more than a few dollars a person a day if, if you shop intelligently and cook. And, and uh, I know this because that's the way I live. 
Time for a couple more quick questions. Uh, the first one for Raj, uh, looking again at your concept, the firms of endearment that have been doing well financially. When you're looking and selecting your companies, how do you guard against sort of a circular reasoning? You report that companies that are have very high levels of employee satisfaction and such are doing very well, but companies that are doing very well tend to be ones where the employees are going to be happier and they're going to be less prone to stress. How do you guard against that? Yeah, you can't completely eliminate that, I think. Uh, to the extent possible, we tried to select the companies while setting aside their financial performance. We did not actually look at stock price or growth rate or profit margins or any of that. So the only financial criteria we had were two. One is that they, first of all, be going concerns not under the threat of bankruptcy. Secondly, that they not have had any accounting scandals or you know having to restate earnings and those kinds of things, manipulation. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, as I said, we didn't have any other financial criteria, and we looked at the financial performance after the fact. But I don't preclude the notion that there could be some kind of a halo effect in there. Having said that, I don't think necessarily that the most profitable companies in the short term tend to have the most satisfied employees. Now, of course, on Wall Street, you'll find exorbitant paychecks, et cetera. But it doesn't mean that those people are happy necessarily in what they're doing, that they're finding fulfillment and meaning and purpose. They're just kind of doing it for a few years, making their money, getting out. I mean, I know a lot of frustrated and unhappy investment bankers, many of whom have left, right? And uh, they just said, we'll make the money and then we'll actually do live the rest of our lives. So you know, I do think that there's a strong connection between the nature of the business, what you're doing, what impact you're having on the world, and the sense of contentment and satisfaction that people feel at the end of the day. You know, Gallup does a study on human happiness, 180 countries called the World Poll, and their book by Jim, their CEO, Jim Clifton, a couple of years ago, he said, this is the most significant finding Gallup has ever had in our history, that the number one driver of human happiness is not your wealth, beyond about $10,000 on a global basis, it's not a strong correlation between wealth and uh, well-being. Uh, it's not your health. People in good health tend to take it for granted. It's not even your family. People who are married and have children are not necessarily happier. But actually, it's your work. People who have meaningful work, where they're respected, where they're doing something that, uh, that connects to their personal passions, where they feel like they're making a difference, those are the people who are truly happy. It's such an important part when of life. When people earn their success, that tends to be deeply fulfilling. And, uh, and, a lot of, and what Raj is saying is true is, when people work in enterprise and succeed and produce uh, and they can provide for their families, this is in a sense deeply fulfilling for people. A lot of ways what we need is to, is to increase um, enterprise in America. As, we, as I previously stated, the Freedom Index were in decline and we need to, uh, to entrepreneurs are the ones that are the job creators and, and we need to encourage that because as they create jobs and people begin to, uh, to work and support their families, that is deeply satisfying and deeply fulfilling for most people. Final question. In your book, you're very critical of high salaries for CEOs. At one point, you compare the, the spiraling of paychecks to a sickness. At a certain point, a person has to say, I've had enough. Broadening that from the financial area, looking at your own career, what you've done, what your goals are for what you want to do, when might you be at a point of your life and career where you could say you've had enough or where will you be when you can say I've had enough? I've already said that. I haven't taken any money from Whole Foods Market since 2006. I haven't taken any, any salary, any bonuses or any stock options. It's all given away to the foundations. So I've been walking my talk. I'm a servant leader. I'm serving the higher purpose of Whole Foods. I've been doing it for going on the seventh, seventh year now. Thank you very much, Mr. Mackey and Mr. Sodia. We've written our book in a way to try to inspire business people to engage in business in a more conscious way. And we define basically four tenets of conscious capitalism. The first tenet is every business has the potential to have a higher purpose besides only making money. And not that there's anything wrong with making money. Doctors make money, but their purpose is not to make money. Their purpose is to heal people. Teachers educate, architects design buildings, engineers construct things. Even journalists, at least some of them, try to uncover the truth instead of <laughs> sensationalizing things. The Hopefully the ones in this room. Um, so 
business has this potential for higher purpose, and that's the first tenet. And uh, secondly, that business should be engaged in to create value for all of its major interdependent stakeholders, not just the investors. That we think of the stakeholders as sort of integrated into a system so that you have customers, employees, suppliers, investors, communities that we're all part of. And the conscious business is deliberately and consciously creating value for all of them. I sometimes explain that, like as a retailer at Whole Foods, that our job is to hire the very best people we can find, make sure they're well trained, and then make sure they are happy in the workplace, that they flourish. And then happy team members My name is Alan Birga. Um, on behalf of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, uh, which is the nonprofit arm of the National Press Club, uh, we are thrilled to have with our book and author series to having, taking place tonight uh, two very special guests, uh, John Mackey and Raj Sisodia, who have, who have collaborated on the book Conscious Capitalism, uh, Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business, um, which I see from the Amazon sales figures is selling quite well. And I know you've been on the road for the last four weeks promoting your book. So thanks for taking the time to come here to the National Press Club this evening. Um, I'm Alan Birga, a former president of the National Press Club from 2010. I cover agriculture for Bloomberg News. So I'm especially excited to ask some questions as a, as a fellow foodie about some of the things that took place in your book, which I found very interesting reading this weekend. Uh, John Mackey, the co-CEO CEO and co-founder of Whole Foods Market has devoted his life to selling natural and organic foods, uh, starting with a store called Safer Way in the 1970s and rising with as well as shaping the growth of the organic food sector. Organic foods were barely in public consciousness when Mackey started. It now takes up about one-eighth of the fresh produce segment of grocery sales and consistently is outstripping the growth of conventional foods in overall retail sales. Mackey's devotion to sustainable, healthy products has led to some unconventional approaches, labeling fish sold in his stores as unsustainable, for example. Research we show that 200 years ago, as capitalism was really invented about 200 years ago, 85% of the people alive 200 years ago lived on less than $1 a day. That figure's gone down to 16%. It's still too high, but the trajectory is we'll probably wipe out abject poverty in the 21st century across the planet rates 200 years ago across the planet were over 90 percent. They're down to about 14 percent today. The average lifespan 200 years ago was only about 30. Today it's 68, 78 in the United States, 80 in Japan, or over 80 in Japan. And business though has primarily been seen and perceived by the critics of business. Business is routinely attacked as selfish and greedy and exploitative. Corporations are portrayed as sociopaths that uh, care only about money and that they're, they need to be caged up for the good of the public. And what we believe is that there's certainly bad actors in, in business. We're not going to defend uh, the Enrons and the WorldComs and the Bernie Madoffs, but most business is based on voluntary exchange and it benefits all of the stakeholders who trade with it, the customers, the employees, the suppliers, the investors, the communities that business is part of. While we like to believe that business is fundamentally good because it creates value, it could be so much better. And we've served the customers better, and that results in happy customers. Happy customers market the business, they're loyal, the business flourishes, that leads to happy investors. Happy team members result in happy customers, result in happy investors. The conscious business understands these interrelationships and then begins to create value consciously and deliberately for all of them. So you can optimize the entire system. The third tenet of conscious capitalism is we need a different kind of leadership, what we call conscious leadership. Leadership that has a higher degree of emotional and spiritual intelligence. Leadership that is not primarily in it for power or wealth, but to serve the enterprise and its higher purpose. So they're a type of servant leaders. And fourth, we have to create cultures deliberately and consciously that help human beings to flourish, reach their highest potential, and self-actualize themselves. There are certain principles and organizations that lead to human flourishing and some that don't. Conscious businesses are deliberate about the creation of their cultures. And so those four principles are the way we organize the book. So higher purpose, 
stakeholder integration, conscious leadership, and empowered cultures. And uh, with that, I think we can get into the questions. All right. Just a little bit about how we're going to go forward this evening. Um, there are question cards that have been provided to you um, on which you can write your questions and pass them forward. We have example. But the numbers don't lie. Whole Foods has seen consistent growth throughout its history, and if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, witness the organic food sections of his competitors' stores. Mackey is also a co-founder of the nonprofit Conscious Capitalism Incorporated, which encourages better business models that unlock the creative potential of employees and emphasizes long-term growth over the short-termism that he says infects businesses today. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that this evening. Also joining us is Dr. Raj Sisodia, co-founder and trustee of Conscious Capitalism and a professor of marketing at Bentley University, which is near Boston. He has written seven books, including Firms of Endearment, a profile of companies that excel in conscious capitalist principles. More about these can be found at the website, ConsciousCapitalism.org, where you can learn more about the concept. Thank you for joining us at the National Press Club this evening, John and Raj. Uh, John, you have a few words to say? Uh, well, yeah, let's see. I can move a little ways here, but not too far. Yeah, thanks, Raj. I thought it'd be a good idea just to do a little bit, since I assume most people haven't read the book that are here, just to sort of tee up kind of the basic principles of the book. So I'll try to do it very quickly. But um, in essence, we believe that uh, business and capitalism have been the greatest value creators in the history of the world. That when our re 